Cecil Phipps. You have a middle name, Cecil? Eldon. Eldon, E-L-D-O-N? Yes. What's your current address? Uh, 1867 North Boulder Court, Casa Grande, Arizona. Do you belong to a Korean War Veterans chapter besides the Prisoners of War one? No. Okay, just this one. Is there a name for it? Uh, do you have one? Is it the national organization or is it a local one? Just this one. And it's, the association? It's a. Uh, of ex prisoners of war. Korean War ex POW Association, I think. Where were you born? Fort Dodge, Iowa. Your date of birth? 5 20 30. What's your education? High school. What did you do before you went into the service? Oh, I worked at uh, two or three different jobs. I trimmed trees, worked for a tree trimming company, and I worked at uh, Hormel's packing plant in Fort Dodge for a while. In Rosedale Creamery. And, and I worked at Rosedale Creamery. Worked there all through high school. Were you uh, drafted or enlisted? I enlisted. With your best friend. Yes, with my best friend. And what branch of the military did you Army. enlist? Army. And uh, what rank did you achieve? Corporal. When you enlisted originally, uh, did you right away go to Korea or? No, I took basic training in Fort Riley, Kansas. Uh, my friend and I were separated during basic because he got sick and had to go to the hospital and so that of course he had to make up the time so they put him in a different company. So you went to basic training with how many months? Uh, three, months. three months. And then I had a 30-day leave of absence and then I went over to Okinawa actually. And I was in Okinawa about a month, and the war broke out. And then they started pulling all the people they could spare to uh, ship to Korea. So you went right from Okinawa to Korea? Yes, on a Japanese fishing boat. With other, lots of other men? With lots of other men? Yes. We landed in Pusan. Okay. Which was all the all the territory they had at that time. They were always squeezed down. Yeah. So you landed in Pusan. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I was assigned to uh, K Company, 35th Infantry. And I was with the company until I was captured. Now you get to tell me what life's like while you were there. Uh, at one time, when we were moving north, we had an accident. A truck rolled off of a bridge and down into a gully. I was on that truck. Did it just get hit or something? Did it... Well, I got thrown out of the truck and landed in a creek bed. Did the truck get hit by? It was raining and, and they, it was a, a bridge that they had just built to carry these trucks across and it, it was muddy and, and the truck just got too close to the edge and it slid off. And uh, so anyway, everybody on that truck was sent back to the first aid camp and I was there about three days and they were going to reassign me to another company. And I told him I'd just soon go back to the company I was with. So they said, go ahead. So I hitched, hitchhiked back to the front of my <laughs> Just maybe one of the dumber things I did, but that's all right. You, you obviously met up with them again? Yes, I did. How long did it take you to do that? Uh, about two days. Two days? Yeah. Two days of hitchhiking and... Yeah. 
but I'd catch a ride with a, a truck that was going part way or whatever, and they uh, then every time I'd see an outfit, I'd ask them where a K-35 was. They'd say, well, it's on over that way someplace. So I finally caught up with them. What battles did you participate in? I don't know the names of the battles. I was the busy town, holding the towns? a gun. The, the what? I was busy holding a gun. I don't okay. know the names of the battles. Okay. But uh, we, we walked basically all the way from Pusan to the Chinese border. Whoa. Whoa. We, uh, we did do some leapfrogging at one time, which is they'd haul a bunch of guys ahead and then and they'd walk and then the next batch they'd haul ahead and then they'd walk. So there was quite a bit of that for a few days. How long did that take you? How long did that take you to get from Pusan to the Chinese border? Uh, till the 28th of November. And when, when did you get to Korea again? August 1st. August. August, September, October. So it took you four months. Yeah. Wow. Wow. The weather must have been pretty warm. Well, it, so August, it was September. up until uh, October, November. Then it started cooling down. Yeah. And did you... Uh, have the proper clothing and boots or summer issue. Summer issue. Summer issue boots and coats. Boots, coats, the whole thing. Okay. And a field jacket was the only jacket I had. Oh boy. Um were you hurt or wounded in any way at this point? Uh not actually. They uh, they examined me at this first aid station, and uh, they said, "Well, you look look like you're all right, so you can go on up to the front." But uh, I landed on my knees in this creek, and uh, I think that's what started my knee problems. But uh, there was never anything verified about that. But he's had four knee replacements. Oh, and that's all you think it all originated then? Yes. That left knee, right knee? Both. Both knees. Just from jumping out of those big trucks or something? or. Yeah, uh, probably when we went off of the bridge, I suppose. It, and there, of course, there's rocks in that oh, creek bed. Oh, yeah, hit the truck or hit the oh. creek bed. Wow. Did the other guys get hurt too? Uh, I don't know. They're... They took us all to the aid station. I don't know who, what happened to any of them because they split us all up from there. And I didn't see any of them again. Describe uh, the circumstances and the time that led to your capture. Okay, we were on top of a mountain and uh, this is the period of time when the Chinese were coming across the border uh, by the 100,000. And there was a company of Chinese coming up the trail toward where we were. And uh, when they got close enough, the captain Howard fired, so we opened up on them. And of course they scattered and, uh, and eventually surrounded the company completely surrounded us. And the captain said, uh, everybody, this is long toward evening, and the captain said, everybody head south, and so we all started going south. And uh, we had to fight our way through the perimeter the Chinese had closed around us. And when we got out of there, there was seven of us that stuck together. And uh, we were walking south at night, 
we'd walk all night long on over the mountains, mountain paths and, and ravines or whatever. And uh, then we'd hide during the day. And we did this for three nights. We had no food to eat. Uh, the water we drank was out of the streams. And uh, on the, the third night, we were getting kind of goofy in our thinking and, you know, getting lightheaded and what have you. Just, uh, we decided it was too tough walking on the mountain pass, so we decided to get on the road. And we did. And we came to a village. And uh, You became lightheaded from no food and stuff like that? Yeah. An exhaustion, right? Mm -hmm. So we came to this village and uh, well, we just walked in and, and no noise, no, nobody around. It was uh, probably two, three in the morning, somewhere around there. And uh, no dogs barking, which if I thought about it, you know, that's, that's a no-no because Every Korean village has a lot of dogs, and they uh, they just raise cane when you come through, whether it's day or night. But it didn't really sink in that there was no dogs barking, and uh, so we walked on through the village, and come out on the south end of the village, and run into uh, Chinese uh, guards. Uh, there were. They had the south side guarded so that the Americans couldn't <laughs> sneak up on them. <laughs> we were coming in from the other end. Anyway, they, they surrounded us and, and we had a choice to surrender or get shot. So we surrendered. And uh, they, we stayed there for two or three days uh, in that village. And they talked to us and tried to find out what, what outfit we were from and, and where we were headed for and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, I just gave them a name, rank, and serial number, and that's all I was required to do. So anyway, they they uh, kept us there for two or three days, and, and then they started marching us north at night. Probably a week. I don't know how long. I kind of lost track of time. They only marched guys at night. Is that right? Right. Nothing, a big... nothing in the daytime. And in, in, if it got towards morning, they'd uh, find a Korean house and, and run the Koreans out and put us in. What was the reasoning for night? Just to keep you hidden? or, or... So that the airplanes wouldn't see us. They were deathly afraid of the airplanes. The American airplanes? Yes. So you and kept marching. Then the, uh, we, uh, we marched north for, I don't know, a, a week or so. I have no idea how much time, how much, uh, ground we covered, but uh, a guy at one time told me that it was about 300 miles from where I was captured to the border. I don't know that, but anyway, <clears throat> when we got to the Chinese border, well, another thing, when you they made you take off your shoes when you went into one of these buildings. and. Uh, they call they called a hooch or something. Is it is that the name they gave to these little houses, a hooch or a house? Well, or something? that was that was the name of the French each group gave. Yeah, them. it's a shack basically, or well, yeah, it's uh -huh. uh, the houses are built out of probably young timber, about so big around, and uh, and they have grass and, and straw woven through the th between the 
sticks and been plastered with mud on both sides. And then they have a thatched roof on it, which is made of straw. And uh, it has a mud floor. And there are usually two rooms. The room they lived in and the kitchen. And in the kitchen room, they had a recessed floor in it. And they'd build a fire, and the smoke from the fire would go out underneath the other floor and up a chimney on the far end. So they keep the floor warm. Yeah. So it's like indoor heating. Yeah. And that's pretty much all they had for heat in those places. This building was off the ground a little bit? No. Or it was on the, on the ground? Right on the ground. And they made these like tunnels for heat or something? Yes. They, well, they, they would take a rock, or just make a tunnel out of rock. They'd, they'd take two rocks like this and set another one flat across, and then they'd put mud over the whole thing and make a fairly smooth floor there. So like a like an underground culvert almost with, yeah. for, for heat. Yeah. Kept going more north. Yeah, we just kept going north all the time, and of course you had to take your boots off, and and it was getting cold at night, and in the morning when you come out to put your boots on, they may not be there, because the Koreans might have wanted them. Some of the guys had just got new shoes or new boots. And mine were pretty old and beat up. I hadn't gotten new ones since I hit Korea. And uh, I suppose they decided they'd take the new ones and help themselves. But anyway, then the only alternative was to walk barefooted or wrap rags around your feet or whatever. So the enemy was taking your boots? They never took mine. No? But uh, a lot of the guys lost their boots. Of course, when we first got captured, we lost our watches, our rings, anything else we had that was worth anything. But we got to China, and we walked across the river into China, walked across on a bridge. And. Uh, you said not a bridge, you walked across on the frozen? Bridge, yeah. You walked across the bridge? The Yellow River? Yes. How many were you at this time? How many did you say? There were seven of us. Seven. The original seven that I was with when we were captured. And uh, they kept us in a large building over there, like a, a, like a community a gathering building or like a community a theater or whatever. And they marched us down the street during the day, you know, and, and let the people see how, the, how they'd caught the Americans in high schools. I don't know what all they were thinking. But they put you on display. Yeah. And you were missing in action from November 28th till February 12th? Yeah, sometime in February. Sometime in February. That's the first that his name appeared on a list of POWs in February. And uh, the Department of the Army would send my parents telegrams every once in a while that I had been reported missing in action and, and that my name had been reported on the POW list, but there was no confirmation of that, things like that. And uh, I have most of those telegrams, yeah. We have uh, thousands of artifacts from the veterans. Excuse we have me? thousands of artifacts. From the veterans, yeah. if you could take a picture of one of those letters and send it to me, we'll add it to the website. If you go to our website, there's thousands okay. of things that people have brought to us. We took photographs of it, but I don't want you to mail it. It's too important. Yeah. So take a picture of it. Okay. So they sent notices to your parents that you're missing in action. 
and um, what happened next? Uh, then we were there, I don't know, three, four days, whatever. It's kind of foggy as to how long. It wasn't a long time. And uh, then they brought us back into Korea, and uh, they moved us around a lot. Uh, we'd be in one place for uh, anywhere from a couple of days to a week. And uh, one of the buildings, that the first one they put us in, was about the size of a double garage. It was uh, uh, like a mud building, same as the houses were made out of. But in the in one corner, <coughs> there was there was no furniture in it at all. And one corner they hit a latrine hole cut in the floor. And uh, whenever that got filled up, the uh, they sent some guy, one of the prisoners outside to clean it out. Uh, there were four or five other guys there when we got there. And I don't know what companies, I don't remember where they were from, but they were GIs. And we stayed there for a while. And uh, we were still in summer issue clothing. And this was uh, getting toward the end of December. You know what town that might have been, or what area? Sinuiju is where we crossed the border. So that's pretty much where you were being moved around? Yeah, and then, then they moved us, and I don't know if they moved us south, north, east, or west, but I assume they were moving us south all the time because eventually we ended up at Pacto. Are you there with six other guys still? Yeah, this, the seven guys were still there. But there were, they had, this was a large village or town or whatever. And uh, they had moved all the Koreans out and taken over all the houses in that town. And they put a, a guard around the perimeter. And one side of it was on the, the Yale Reservoir. And what reservoir was that? The Y A L U. And I'm probably not pronouncing those names right. That's okay. That's, that's the way I learned them. By this time, the water must have been frozen or getting pretty cold. Well, yeah, this was uh, the end, toward the end of December. And uh, the weather is very similar to Iowa's weather. So it was, it was cold. It must have been freezing with just a summer issue. Yeah. Yes, it was. So they, anyway, we got to Pectong and uh, they put us in, in these mud huts that uh, were scattered all over the, it was a, a kind of a natural valley coming up away from the reservoir. And uh, there were houses all over the hillsides they put us in these different buildings, and uh, we stayed. I stayed there until August of uh, '51. But there were 1,500 men died there that winter because of the uh, the cold, the bad food, the dysentery. Just a, a lot of sickness. And they just gave up. They just gave up. And a lot of them just gave up. They, they couldn't uh, force themselves to eat the food. So they starved. And, and pretty much starved themselves to death. Now they had, was like the wounded probably didn't get any medical attention, no, right? No medical attention. There was a doctor, there, a GI doctor that uh, you could go on sick call, but he didn't have any medicine. Uh, ground up charcoal was the only medicine he had. Pretty much everybody was was sick, more or less. It, nobody was in good condition. And they had a... Your weight started out. I, I was 190, 
95 pounds when I when I got to Korea, and I was in very good physical condition. And so, in the spring, in May, I was at about 75 pounds. I think the lice were probably one of the biggest killers out there. They, uh, they'd suck your blood, you know, and if you get a thousand lice on you, they could suck a lot of blood out. We, uh, there were wood fences around every little house in that whole town. And by spring, there were no wood fences at all. They were all gone. So it was used up by the soldiers, the enemy, and everybody? We had burned them for wood. It's the only access we had to firewood, so we used it. I don't know whether the Koreans used any of them or not, but or the Chinese, but I know we did. You were eating rice, corn? Uh, not much rice. Uh, we had corn. We Is had, corn kernels? Dried kernels? They had some ground corn. They had, had maize. Uh, Sorghum, millet. Sorghum and millet, just. What is millet? I hear that word. It's. Bird seed. You know what they sell for bird seed around here? That's millet. That little yellow stuff, little tiny yellow pellets, that's millet. Where does it come from? It's a you know, seed. It's a little, it's just a seed from like grass or something? Yeah, it's like a grass that grows up with a uh, head on it, you know, like wheat does. No, no green vegetables, nothing. Nothing like that, uh, and uh, very little meat at all. Just once in a while, they'd put enough in it to flavor it, you know. But they never got any meat. And uh, they had a guard that his job was to come around every morning and check to see if everybody was there. The only thing he could say in English was, "How many dead?" He'd open the door and he'd say, how many dead? And every morning there'd be two or three anyway that, that died during the night. I say the average room was probably 10 by 12 feet. And uh, they were packed in so tight that you had to lay on your side. And if you turned over during the night, everybody else had to, in that room had to turn over because when you turn over and you're, you got your knees pulled up, it creates a problem for the next guy, so he's got to turn over. You see a lot of punishment of the POWs? Yes. They care to tell us? Uh, they had a, what they called a parade ground in a big flat area, and uh, you'd see guys standing out there, uh, almost constantly different people holding logs or something over their head and of course it was cold out and you're standing there freezing to death and, and uh, they, uh, I don't know how they, they arrived at how long you had to stand there but it was very different. Some guys stood there a long time and some of them just a couple hours was good enough. And they did this for what crime or what well, offense. for whatever they wanted, you know, if if you uh, spoke unkindly about the Chinese, you could figure out getting punished if they heard you. Uh, just if you were caught stealing food out of the kitchen down there, they'd, they'd stand you out there. That was a major form of punishment in that camp. Were there any? You hear the holes? Were there any like pits that they put you in or anything? Not in that camp. A box. Were there any pits like did they say the hole? Yeah. In in Changzong there was. It was. The gravel pit? Yeah. Did anybody try to brainwash you? 
to be communists? Every day. Every day. Well, how would they do that? Well, <clears throat> in Pectong, they'd stand everybody out on this parade ground, and uh, the company commander there would give a big long speech, maybe a couple hours, in Chinese, which was, nobody understood it, of course. Then the interpreter would tell you what he said for the next couple hours. And all this, all the time, it's very cold out there. You know, and they've got these big warm coats and we're standing out there in, in summer gear. The interpreter was uh, Chinese? Yes. What, what are the things they kind of said? Just, do you, do you remember? I'm sure you remember. <laughs> it was basically the same thing every time. It was how bad the Americans were. They were war mongers. Uh, they liked to pick on Ridgeway, General Ridgeway in particular, because he happened to be in command when I was captured. That's General Ridgeway? Yeah. And uh, they would they would say bad things about him, that, like uh, he was a war monger, and they'd draw ridiculous pictures of him, caricatures. And uh, I tell you how good the Chinese people were and, and how well we were being treated, which, you know, we were living it. We, were, we weren't buying any of that. But uh, the, the, the theory is <clears throat> if, if your friend does something wrong or says something bad about the Chinese, you go tell the chief and then he'll reward you and he'll put your friend in prison. And that's basically how the whole system works over there. I heard that there was like subordinate soldiers, like no rank pretty much, uh, and they were like, uh, thought they were the boss or something and they beat up everybody. Is that what you saw? I did see some, yeah. For like no reason at all, or just looking at you the wrong way, or? Yeah, just whatever they decided. Uh, they were very free with the gun butts. They'd, they'd, I've been struck with a gun butt a few times. Uh, because I didn't understand what they said or they didn't move fast enough when they said something or, uh, you know, minor violations, but uh, they were upset about it, so they showed their displeasure. Did you get moved again to another camp? Uh, yes, from, I moved, I went on the same boat that Frenchy was on. and. Uh, it was around the 1st of August, I thought, because, and I say the 1st because when we got to this Camp 3, all these people had vegetable gardens in the back of their house. And uh, when they put us in the front door, we went right on through and out the back door to see what was there, and we worked with gardens over pretty good. They didn't have much garden left because we hadn't had anything, green vegetables or nothing, since we'd been captured. But that mass hit the wire, like you said. Yeah. Electrical shock. Yeah, yeah that, that mass hit, the, hit that electric wire and wrapped them together and, <laughs> and really had everybody shook up. And that, that electrical wire was across the river pretty much? Or? Yes. It was a long span across there, probably, I don't know, maybe a quarter of a mile even. It was it was really a wide reservoir at that point. The yellow. Yeah, the yellow. How many men were in these boats? I mean, there was like four or five boats or two boats? Or? I think there were three, but I'm, I'm not positive about that. But uh, there were probably 50 guys on each boat, I don't know. That, they were a, that big? Yeah, they were, they were large. They, uh, they were longer than this room is, and probably 10 feet wide, I suppose, I don't know. 
But I they, envisioned like a rowboat. I don't know why. No, no they weren't rowboats. And uh, they had, the masts were, I don't know, at least 20 feet high, I suppose. That sails or something? Or is it, was it, would a mast for sails or yeah. sailboats? Yeah, and it may have been because the river was high, you know, yeah. higher than usual, because I'm sure they went up down there before and never had any problems. But, but they were actually uh, kind of a barge. They they just hold supplies on it mostly. You know. mm -hmm. They just commandeered them to all their people. So Camp 3 had a little vegetables. Yes. There was also a cornfield in the middle of the camp. But uh, anyway, the, the Chinese kept us on the barges for couple hours and they went in and they moved all the Koreans out of these houses and then they moved the, the GIs in and, uh, and the GIs took over everything and then <laughs> that next day we got a lecture on we shouldn't eat the people's food because the Korean people's food because that was all they had to eat but in this cornfield anyway they the corn was was not ready to harvest at that time so they let them, let the Koreans come back into the village to uh, weed the crop, weed the corn, and whatever they had to do with it, fertilize it, whatever. The black guy, he was a pretty big guy too, and he got caught stealing peppers out of the Koreans' gardens, and they had a. There was a rise alongside the road there, about the height of that dresser over there. And uh, the Chinese way of thinking is, if you confess your sins, then you, then we can forgive you and you be, be a good guy again. So he got up there and he said, I confess I got caught stealing peppers. But I promised never to get caught stealing peppers again. And the crowd just erupted, cheering and waving, clapping their hands. The Chinese missed it all. <laughs> they didn't know what he'd said. Oh. He, he didn't promise not to do it, just not to get caught doing it. I heard that the the black African Americans or black prisoners were kept separate. Is that true? Uh, yes. Although I don't, I don't think it was the Chinese intent. Uh, the blacks congregated together uh, in this building that Frenchy talked about. Uh, one end of it was all black. I think it was by choice because they wanted to be with their fellows, you know, their own. Uh, their own kin, and, and you know, it, uh, they felt more comfortable with. But the other half of the building was white, and we intermingled back and forth, talked and, and uh, played cards and all that stuff, you know. But the. Uh the enemy didn't distinguish. Did I don't it? think the enemy separated us. Mm -hmm. I think it was just the, the blacks wanted to be all together in that particular instance. No, I don't know about anything else. So we had a group of Mexicans in Camp 3, and they all congregated to one building. Uh, in fact, the Chinese had scattered them out through the camp, and they would see, would run into a buddy, and, and uh, he'd say, "Well, go on over and stay with us." You know, they, the Mexicans all ended up in one building. So, among friends, they congregated together. Yeah, and, I, don't, uh, I don't think it was uh, Chinese didn't separate us racially in that particular instance. They just voluntarily did it themselves. Yeah. Did you have like a job at the POW? Uh, nothing specific. Uh, we did work. We'd go up in the hills and, and haul wood back that the, 
that uh, they had the Koreans cut for them. Uh, and sometimes we'd walk three or four miles to do that. Oh. And you, you carried it on your shoulder and you carried what they told you to carry, not what you thought you could carry. One time to get wood we had to go over around the end of the uh, bay there and uh, there was another village over over there across the water from us and it was full of POWs and uh, you know some of the guys there knew some of the guys that were walking through and uh, we'd holler at them and, and the Chinese guards would get upset about it and start pointing their rifles around. They didn't shoot anybody, but he was always trying to escape. And uh, I, I always tried to help him out, you know. He, uh, we got uh, some bread one day, so uh, once a week they, they had some steam raised bread, which when it dried out it was hard as a rock, but it was still bread. So I would save half of what I got and uh, anything else I, I had that I could help him with. Uh, I made some socks for his feet out of a piece of cloth and, uh, and I don't, I uh, traded somebody for a needle I guess because I had a needle. I know the Chinese didn't, wouldn't let me carry it through if they'd have seen it. And I pulled thread out of a blanket that they issued to us uh, to sew the socks with. And uh, blanket was getting pretty threadbare before I got out of there. What'd you, what'd you use for needle? I, I traded a sugar ration. Somebody had smuggled a needle in and I traded a sugar ration for it. And uh, so anyway, he took off. He tried at least four different times to escape. They always caught him, brought him back, and then they take him down the well. The first time they put him in the in this gravel pit, a big hole at the edge of camp, and there were other guys in there, and uh, they'd keep him in there for whatever time they wanted to, you know, it was never the same thing all the time, for, uh, it wasn't the same thing for everybody, but, uh, and this was winter or summer, you, you were in the hole, that's where you were, but uh, then they, <clears throat> did you see the bridge on the River Kwai? Yes. Okay, you know, this tin shack that they put this guy in? Very hot. Okay, that's what he had serve a month's punishment in down by down to company headquarters. In a metal shed. It it was a metal uh, box. It was too small to to sit up in and too short to lay down in. But he was only five foot tall so he had a box on that one. But he could he could sit in it and uh, sometimes they'd let him out to use the bathroom and sometimes they wouldn't. Just depend on who was on duty. But he spent a month in that a number of times. Thirty days? Thirty days. He did try to escape in the winter? Yes. And he was still going to that metal shed whether it was hot or cold. Yeah. So he did he decide not to try to escape anymore? Did he kept doing it or well, they finally repatriated us. The only way he got out. He, yes. always, he was always trying to. He, he get out of that camp. I don't know how he got out of that camp so many times, but he always did. How long was he gone before he got captured? Like a day, uh, two, three? Sometimes a week, sometimes just a couple of days. But uh, the Koreans always turned him in if they saw him. Oh, uh, the villagers? 
No, the civilians. Civilians? Yeah. If, uh, if they s ever saw anybody that wasn't supposed to be there, well, it was just like I told you. You, know, you, tell, you tell the chief and he'll reward you and punish that guy. And you guys wore the green fatigues, right? The, the uniforms? Blue. blue. Yeah. Everything was blue. blue. So you were distinguishable. Yep, we stood out pretty well. Uh, it was pretty hard to uh, travel around that country without seeing a Korean because they had fields like uh, maybe a hundred foot square on the side of a mountain and they they planted that because there was no soil there to grow something. And they all by all hand work they plowed with an ox or something. Uh -huh or by hand, plowed it by hand, or whatever. And they'd, they'd dig it up and, and uh, plant it with something and harvest it by hand. And their whole existence was hand labor. You pretty much stayed in that one Camp 3 for yeah, until we Yeah, stayed in Camp 3 until they started moving us back across the border. When were you uh, released? 28th of August. 1953, right? Back to the train. Yeah. They, uh, they'd call out a bunch of names. Uh, they started around the first part of August at our camp. And they'd call out a bunch of names, and the, the guys, would, they'd load them on a truck, a covered truck. It's always a covered truck. Uh, so you couldn't see where you was going. And of course, we didn't know where we was going, and they wouldn't tell us. So rumors were running wild. But anyway, the day that they called my name, we uh, got on this truck, and they drove, I don't know how far, probably half a day's drive, and put us on a train in a box car, or cattle car, or something. It, it had slits on the side. You could see out of the train, so the, out of the car. The, but, the, it was, a, it was a, just a cargo train? Yeah, yeah just a freight train. And uh, as you're going through the mountains, you know, you run around the edge of a mountain and you look out there, you had nothing there for miles. You know, just uh, nothing but air. So it, it was pretty, kind of scary, really. Uh, and we were two days on the train, nothing to eat those two days. And then they, they unloaded us and put us on a truck again with a covered, a canvas cover, and uh, drove a couple hours or so. And then they put us in another camp. And we were in this camp uh, almost a week. And we didn't, didn't have anything to do, just sit there and get into trouble mostly. Pretty much knew you were being released and you, no, were, you didn't know yet? we did not know. We were guessing, but we didn't know. We they were didn't taking, know if they were taking them down the road to be shot or what. Yeah, they didn't know. They didn't say. No, they would never tell us. So then they... Every day they'd call out a bunch of names in this camp, and, and there were other guys coming in all the time, and the guys leaving, you know. And so there's all kinds of rumors going around. But, uh, but you didn't know where you were either, right? No, I had no idea where I was. Didn't know the name of the town or nothing. And so anyway, they called out my name one day, and. Uh, loaded us on the truck and a Chinese guard got in on the end gate, right just on the last seat. It had seats along the side and so we drove down the road a ways, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, whatever, and the truck stopped, this guard got out, another guard got in with a rifle and we drove for ways farther and 
you know, you lose track of time when you can't see anything around you. But anyway, this happened four times. The fourth time... The guard was, exchange? The guards were changing? Yes, the guard would change places. And the fourth time it happened, a GI, this Chinese guard got out and a GI got in. And had a pistol on, too. It was, it was a... It was a... MP or somebody? Or? An officer. Oh. Uh, and uh, so he got in and, and uh, he told he told us, "You're going home, boys." And that's the first we'd actually heard that. So they drove another, I don't know, fifteen, twenty minutes, whatever, and uh, we got into Penman John. The first thing they did was run us through a shower and spray us with uh, DDT powder because we, we had had lice for years, you know, just... And uh, then they give us clothes, they give a new issue of clothing, and uh, then they, we talked to uh, intelligence officers and they wanted to know what we had seen on the way down you know as far as uh, traffic is for uh, military traffic and you know trying to find out if the Chinese were planning a surprise or something on us and uh, we hadn't really seen any big troop movements or, or anything because you were in a closed track and so then after we got through talking to them, they took us out into a big tent where uh, there were a lot of uh, reporters from a lot of newspapers in the country, in our country. And uh, there was a, a Gordon Gavick from Des Moines Register was there, which is a large newspaper. So who it was again, Mr. Gavin? Gordon Gavick, G-A-M-M-I-C, I think. Or IK, I don't remember. From a big newspaper? Yeah, from the Des Moines Register. Des Moines? Yes. Des Moines, Iowa Register. Yep. And then he talked to you? So I talked to him for a while and, and told him some of my experiences. And, and then he wrote a big article for the newspaper. You have that, right? still have that newspaper on it? No, no, we don't have that one. No. And uh, then they they fed us, uh, gave us some food, and uh, mostly meat and potatoes. I didn't get ice cream like Frenchie did. <laughs> Probably <laughs> just as well. <laughs> and uh, then then I got on a helicopter and I went to Incheon. Yeah, I was there ahead of Frenchie. So you went on a helicopter? Yeah. To Incheon? Incheon. That's where, the, that's where MacArthur landed, right? Yes. You got on a boat? Yeah, we, we uh, well, I, I think we stayed on shore that day that night, but uh, I think next day we got on the boat, uh, General Black. The same one that? The same one as Frenchie was on. On the Black, we were out, I don't know, two or three days anyway when this happened, but uh, the, the XPOWs were given uh, premium treatment. I mean, we, we got to eat, go eat first. We got to eat whatever we wanted to eat, you know. And they did fix, fix some special food for us because uh, I mean, our stomachs hadn't had any decent food for so long. That, and they gave us a lot of ice cream if we wanted ice cream. And, and uh, I don't know what the meals were for the other guys, but I'm sure they fed them well. But. Uh, the other 
the GIs that were on there had to do all the details. They had to wash the kitchen, wash the dishes, and carry the food up from the stores, and uh, scrub the decks and all the work. You know, they had to do all the work. We didn't have to do any. To do all the maintenance probably, and everything. Yeah, that was probably a sore spot with them anyway. Uh, but anyway, this riot that Frenchy was talking about. I was on deck when this thing started. Was they were being you? They were being called communists or something, or, or yeah. just uh, or special a, treatment? You think? There was a GI who was reading a comic book, and we had never seen anything in print except propaganda. And uh, so this POW asked the guy. He said, "Hey, can I look at that when you get through with it?" He said, I wouldn't give you commie XOBs nothing. And that's what started the whole thing. And so then the word got spread around and that's when they that's when Frenchy the guys started coming out of the hole. Everybody back to their bunk. Everybody had to go back to their own bunk. And we were locked down for a while until they got things straightened out. So where'd you land? Frisco. With Frenchy? With Frenchy, yeah. But, see, Frenchy went to Presidio, and I had relatives waiting at the dock for me. And I stayed there a week or so. And then I went to, uh, I flew to Sioux City, Iowa, and uh, the city of Fort Dodge sent a delegation over to the airport in Sioux City. The next Friday night, it's a football game out in the stadium, uh, they presented me with a watch and uh, had it engraved on the, got my name engraved on the back of it. I bet you have that safe someplace. Yeah, I have it. It's, I, I did wear that for a long time, but it finally quit running, but I still have it. So you were recognized at the football game, everything? Yeah. Well, it was a long time coming. Yeah. You know? So how long were you there total uh, as, as a prisoner? As a prisoner, 33 months. Uh, what is the most memorable part of your Korean War experience? Was going off of that bridge in a truck and ending up down in the creek and then hitchhiking my way back to the front lines. You'll never forget that truck? No. How did this uh, Korean War and being a prisoner of war affect you or impact you to this day? It made me very proud of my country. Did it affect your family when uh, you went to war? Uh, yes, how did it, it did. affect them? Because they didn't hear from you for a while. Yeah. See, I was not married at that time. So, but uh, my mother and father were still alive. And I had uh, ten brothers and sisters. Ten? Yeah. So and they, they were all concerned about it. Uh, or six, six of our family had served in, the, or five of them had served in the Second World War, and I was in Korea. I had two sisters and three brothers during the Second World War that were in service. But they all returned home safely. None of the others were prisoners of war. No. Any other thoughts, Cecil? You want to say or anything you would like to say? Anything else you'd like to say that I didn't ask or you have on your mind? Or why don't you join them?
I just think that uh, mandatory service should be required. I think a couple of years in the, in the service with maybe six months in a foreign country so that these people would see how other people live and how good they have it here. And it would wake them up and get a little more patriotism in this country. He is really proud to be an American. He didn't talk about it for 25 years. It was bottled up tight inside of him for 25 years. The battle was raging inside of him, but it, until he went to a prisoner of war reunion, some of, the, some of his buddies had called him and said, you have to come. And he went and there wasn't the dry eye in the place with, with all the emotions that were uh, relived. But it, I think it has really helped him through a lot of issues. And he is absolutely the best husband, father, that a wife or family could have. And I like it. You answered all the questions wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You get all this. Thank you for thank you. preserving the story. We thank you. <laughs>